everybody i'm sal kalani this is reggie Steele, and welcome to spitballing uh man we got a great day ahead of us man we uh i'm excited about today's episode we have a guest another uh, guest back to back guests back, back to back guests we're trying to make it happen man um before we get into the guests before we get our guest uh i just want to say just take a moment to uh, acknowledge the passing of uh comedian uh, one oh, of my Louis favorite Anderson friends. passed away. Louis Anderson passed away today, folks. Uh, 68 yeah. years old, man. Uh, you see Meatloaf did too. And Meatloaf, I saw that too. Both in their 60s. Uh, Louis passed away from complications of cancer. and um, Blood cancer, I heard. Oh, wow. That's, that's, can, that's, that's a, Yeah, that's a thing. That's insane. That's a thing. Yeah, yeah it's a thing. So Meatloaf uh, was actually, I think, 74. And it looks like he might have been unvaccinated and died of COVID. Yo, you cannot. Are we gonna start the episode like this? I mean, that's what I read, bro. We're gonna start, I mean, dude. It's such propaganda. He, he caught COVID and it killed him quick. And dude. he was really against uh, vaccine mandates in countries and stuff. Or okay, well, let's just say he caught see. COVID. Let's say he died from complications of COVID because there've been plenty of people who've gotten COVID that were not vaccinated and survived. So, and there are people who've had who've gotten There's vaccinated. There's a lot more who There died are people who've, who've been vaccinated and have also died. I'm just saying. All right, so we, talk. Let's see about our guests. Let's get them in, dude. Right? <laughs> we will not perpetuate the propaganda, bro. I'm just saying. I saw Reggie okay. last night. And, yes, sir. Uh, it's good to see him. And, yeah, man. Uh, it's good. It was good times. That's yeah, I got fun. to see Sal. I got to see you last night at the San Francisco Punchline, man. And uh, I got to tell you, this set. Sal killed it, man. Give it up for Sal. It was folks. cool. Some of the new stuff was working. It, it works in a real comedy club. If it's working in a taco bar, it's going to work probably in the club. There you go. Because <laughs> all I know is I saw two, count them, two applause breaks last night. He went yeah, on I one of his rants. I got to do it again. I got to yes. listen to it. Because a lot of the new stuff, some of the new stuff, I was still trying to grasp the words while I was up there. Like, you, yeah. get, you know what I mean? You know how it yeah. is. Like, and then once you do the stuff that you've done a while, it just comes to you so much quicker. And it's like, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's it was good to see, thing. man. It was good to see. Only thing I would say is, uh, hey, folks, and it's just a moment of like, you know, one comment to another. Yo, man, in those moments of the applause break, pause yeah i go a little quick people, trying, <laughs> the people are trying to give you your props and you're like i ain't got time for that i gotta yeah, say I got my time next for day. that i got more jokes shut <laughs> exactly. up i'm like yo let them have the full experience man slow your ass down uh, that's true slow so it, that is a fun down. part and be present be present yo give them a moment and then say I was, thank you i was and trying, then to, I was trying it out yeah right, so it was uh, good so it was good who's our guest today reg oh man should i just you want to let him in i can do the introduction well, yeah, well, me, oh, you don't want to give anything, say anything about him before we bring it, a comedy writer. No, because I want to say all that in front of you. All right, well. Okay. Here we go. We'll let him in now. All right. I'm excited about to get today's guest, guys. So, so uh, I'd like to welcome to the show. Uh, our guest today is a, is a friend of mine that I've met years ago, and our paths have uh, continued to cross over the years. He's a, a man that wears a, a number of different hats, uh, comedian, writer, actor, producer, director. A man does it all, he runs the gamut. Please welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Suli McCullough. How yes, you doing, man? there he is. Yes, sir. What's going yeah. on? Not How much, man. What's going on, guys? How are you? I'm good, man, I'm good. I had a uh, uh, eventful morning. Okay. Had to uh, take my son to school, get him ready, and then a couple of other things. But I'm here. I'm with it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Nice. I love that. Yo, real quick, I want to introduce you to uh, to one of my best friends uh, in the world in comedy and in real life, uh, Sal Kalani. Uh, Sal, what's up? Nice to meet yeah. you, Suli. I, I've I've seen you. But I've never met you. I think personally, I might have met you once at the Punchline, but I remember seeing you come in on Sunday nights back in the day doing some sets. And uh, yeah, funny, funny that. man. Yeah, yeah, my uh, my uncle lives next door to the Punchline, so it's oh the really? Most oh, convenient club 
ever created for me. <laughs> I literally have to just like he used to live right next door in the the apartments like right next to the club. So I literally wow. the elevator ride down was longer than walking to the club. Oh wow. 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 Yeah. Okay. It was good, dude. It it was a it was a good thing. And then he moved. He's still in the same complex, but he moved to a better building because he leveled up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> for the view. Yeah. Uh, and so now he lives like across the street from the ferry building, and uh, and and sometimes I I come up there just to take that view in because he's got a <laughs> a view that's spectacular. Oh, like nice. I literally don't leave that area. I can do everything I need to do. Like awesome. get, like you know comedy. I can. I can go eat at a little fancy place. Like it's all good. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Like ball at the Y, the Embarcadero Y. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, you got it all set up, huh? I got it all. I got, it, got all. it all. I actually need to work the punchline more just so I can visit my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? No, I wish I had that excuse. I'm like, yo, can I get on more, please? So, actually, that's a different thing, but we can get into that later. Um, sure, man. Uh, Suli, man, it's so good to see you, man, and getting a chance to talk to you the other day. Uh, so I was super excited about, about having you on the show. Uh, I just, I think you're a super talented dude, man, and to be able to, to have you here with us, man, it's, a, it's an honor. Um, all right, so I just want to ask you, dude, from the beginning, like, where and how did you get into comedy? Like, what, where did it start for you? That's a good question. Uh, I think initially it started as a kid. Like, mm. I always paid attention to comedy in a way where I felt comics were important, if that makes sense. I felt what they had to say was important. And I always gravitated towards their outlook on life. Like I felt like they were special, you know what I mean? Like the ability to make people laugh and get people's attention, like to make people stop and go, let's, let's hear what this dude has to say. You know what right. I mean? Like. I think I watched um, The Tonight Show that way and the comics on The Tonight Show. Like there was something about it as a, as a kid that it was always important to me. I was like, wow. well, these guys are specialists. Like they're like almost like spies in a way. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> how, would you see, how would you see comedians that early? Like would you, a parent show uh, you? You know, or you like, you know I've watched The Tonight Show. I've watched like the normal outlets where comics got their breaks. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I just remember being a kid and being like, yo, what they're doing is, is interesting. Wow. Um, in high school, uh, you know, that's when like Eddie Murphy was on SNL and he was blowing up so much that, you know, seeing a young, funny dude that kind of like connected to you and watching like the explosion of his career that's where I think I was like, yo, I want to do this. You know what I mean? Like I right. want to, like, I was almost jealous of what he was building. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like the, the, you know, the phenomenon is like, yo, this dude gets to be funny and, you know, like, and, and <laughs> handsome, right? Yeah. And right? he was young and he was like risky. And, and I felt like in a lot of ways, comedians have that ability to, erase a lot of the sins of society you know what i mean like oh, wow. okay. like you know racism didn't matter you know like he was bigger than racism like it was it was deep like my connection yeah. to what he was able to accomplish you know it motivated me i was like yo comedy's a gift and having a sense of humor is a gift and um to be able to like get everything out of yourself to do that it sets you up to to change the world in a way. Wow, that's wow. huge, man. And you, I mean, you realize that at what age? How old were you at the I time? Was, I, was in, I was in high school at the time. You know, I paid attention to comics when I was much younger than that, but in high school was when it was just really starting to come together for me. Okay. I did, uh, at my high school, I, I went to Cupertino High School in Silicon Valley. Okay, uh, I was gonna ask you, where'd you grow up? Yeah, so, so, I, so I grew up in, in, you know, in Northern California. Right. And, oh, okay. uh, and so, you know, when Eddie Murphy was taken off, I was doing morning announcements, uh, you know, where you would be on the PA and the, ah, you know, yeah. and, were you, 
And Maybe, I, I was gonna do, say you have a great voice. You you do yeah, you have a like, I, yeah. I, so like that was the first that was like intro to stand up. And I remember I used to do this thing where I would do at the end of the morning announcements, I would do the dumb joke of the day. And <laughs> it it's funny when I think about it now because it was pretty smart to frame it as the dumb joke of the day because that took all the judgment off it. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, like, it could yeah. be funny or not funny. Yes, right? like you right. call it a dumb joke. So if it's not that funny, you're like, well, if he did say it was a dumb joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's, that's awesome. like my first real like, okay, I'm experimenting with comedy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and and that was cool like people paid attention they liked it like I was a really like kind of like super nerdy kid but that was like my little superpower you know what I mean yeah, yeah. and it was and it was weird how it brought people together and they kind of like root like teachers liked me they rooted for <laughs> the kids liked me it was just a cool it was a cool little thing to do in high school and then I you know I hosted like the rallies and that kind of stuff oh, wow. so I, at that point I was already like trying to figure out how I could do this. I did speech and debate too. So, oh, wow. Wow, like, that's interesting. Yeah, those were all like the the intro to comedy. Like oh. I didn't officially start doing it until, well, I, I went to San Jose State for two years. And hey, you're a Spartan? Was, um, sorry to interrupt you, but what I years were you at San Jose State? What years, were, what years uh, were you at San Jose State? High school, 85. And oh, so, okay. Oh, yeah. So 85 yeah. to 80. I'm, I'm grown. I'm a grown ass man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let the voice fool you. <laughs> yeah, really. Straight up grown up. <laughs> okay. Still look good, though. You know what I'm saying? You got the, you got that yeah, youth. I got the salt and pepper. I, you know, I'm, I'm for real with it. I'm, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Uh, but uh, so I spent two years at San Jose State, and at San Jose State, they had this comedy competition. And they held it in the pub, but I remember I wasn't 21 yet, so I couldn't get inside the pub and okay. I couldn't enter the competition. And the way this pub is at San Jose State, they had these mirrors and then these like blinds, right? Okay. And so sometimes they draw the blinds and then sometimes they leave them open. But I remember being on the outside of the window and the blinds were drawn and I could see the competition going on. Oh. And I was like, Dang, I, I want to do that and I can't do it. So that was like, by that time I knew, okay, I want to do stand up for real, but it wasn't until I transferred to UCLA. UCLA had a comedy club where we would get together. We would help pitch each other jokes and stuff. And then we would do shows in the dorms and we would book like we would book one working comic in L.A. And so that's when I like I was officially like a real stand up. Whoa. OK. All right. Hold up. Before you go there, because I got to ask you this. Let's go all the way back real quick. Is there someone funny in your family? Like, did your parents ever watch comedy? Like, you know, do you remember being younger? Because a lot of times with with uh, with a lot of headliners that we've talked to, they all have this this origin, the story of, well, you know, the parents were playing records, right? Or they were up late night watching something well, or know, somebody was funny in the family. When I was younger, I would listen to Dr. Demento a lot. You know what I mean? Wow. That I was, don't know Dr. Demento. That's, that's some nerd kid shit there. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, like Dr. Demento was this dude, like almost like Wolfman Jack, but he played funny records. Like he really was devoted to comedy. And he was the dude that would expose me to who was funny doing funny stuff and you know he so, discovered didn't he discover weird al he did he discovered yeah. weird, weird al yankovic yeah wow okay so, i gotta look this guy up i feel lost yeah, right that, now. that was on the radio um oh, okay. Mento was you know so that was like my like i cared about comedy you know what i mean yeah, like, and yeah. I, was, I would see i would seek it out almost like you know like i like hip-hop and i've always been a hip-hop head and there was a time before hip hop was mainstream that you had to seek it out. Comedy was the same way. Like you had mm -hmm. to, you kind of had to have your ear to the grind to find what was going on in comedy. Right. And the Memento show was great because he would do a, like a top five, a funny five or something yeah. where it'd be like the the funniest comedy records. You know what I mean? <laughs> nice. So, like you, like I felt like I was getting my dose of, oh, okay, this is what's going on in the comedy scene. Wow. Okay. All right. So, all right. Now we fast forward. We go back to UCLA okay. and the club. 
And um, so you fit and you're writing yeah, with the so guys. Yeah, I went to the comedy club. Uh, Chris Spencer and I went to college together. Chris Spencer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Comedy club. Um, like 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 I said, like I was doing in high school. In college, I'd sort of accelerated that. So I was hosting all the events at college that I could too. Uh, we were doing shows in the dorms. They used to do at UCLA. They would do a Tuesday night comedy show in the Cooperage, which was the eating area. And that was a book show with three headliners. And because it was LA, it was always really good comics that were in town. So oh, wow. I started hosting that or doing guest spots on that because I was the funny dude from UCLA. Right. Um, but like my real break break happened. Uh, they did a comedy contest and it was a nationwide comedy search sponsored by a chewing gum company and Doritos, which doesn't go together. <laughs> they, don't go together. <laughs> they don't go together at all. It was a it was a comedy talent search that had two parts of a prize. One was they were looking for the funniest comic, which I entered it for that. I made it to the first round and then didn't make it any further. And I was bummed about that. And then the second part of the competition was uh, the school that eats the most Doritos and saves the rappers and turns them in, you get a free concert by Jerry Seinfeld. Wow. It, wow, that's huge. Yeah, which is, it, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. Somehow, UCLA, we won. You know? Oh, wow. <laughs> Had nothing to do with me. <laughs> okay. I was gonna say, damn, Sula, you ate that many Doritos, bro. And I, like, <laughs> I didn't care about that part of the contest at all. I was like, yo, I'm gonna get in this, I'm gonna win it. Like, you know what right. I mean? Like, I right. was like, so single minded in purpose, I forgot about this other part of it. Right. But apparently, we won, and Seinfeld did a show at UCLA, and four of us from the comedy club ended up opening for him. Oh, wow. wow, dude! Yeah. Isn't it weird how it comes around? Oh uh, man, crazy! So, cra here's, uh, let me tell you this: this is even funnier, dude. So, I was <laughs> such a like so like I said, I was like this this nerd that was single minded and focused. Like I am doing comedy; nobody's gonna stop me. And uh, they had it in the contract that the opener can't do more than 20 minutes. And so there were four okay. of us, right? So we right. divided the time, just, you know, five minutes each, right? Right. And I was so like, you know, five minutes, like five minutes at UCLA. Are you kidding? Like <laughs> almost dropped out so everybody else could have an extra minute. Oh, wow. I mean, you're a nice guy. You're a nice guy. I give you credit for that. But I don't know what I am, dude. Like, yeah. <laughs> had like my level of morals was so like self righteous that Correct. I'm glad I didn't do that because <sighs> I did the right. spot. Um, Jerry's managers were in the audience. Afterwards, they gave me their card. They said, "Give us a call. We think you have a lot of talent." Wow, so, Sal. It's like your first book show. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. So, okay. Hold up, Sudi. I just got to say this. Sal, how, how badly has every comic wanted this oh, scenario this is, to happen? Right? This is like, crazy. It's, dude, this it's, it's, so, it's so weird that it happened like that. And then even me being like, five minutes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what, what can I do in five minutes? You right? know what's funny, though, is like when... Uh, Jerry was really good because we were in the green room, you know, just cocky college kids. And we were arguing over who's gonna go first, right? And it was like me and Chris and two other guys. And, you know, we're like, I'm not going first. Well, I'm not going first, right? Yeah. Jerry's listening to us and taking it in. And he goes, you should wanna go first because you get to set the tone of the night. And we were like, heads blown, right? Yeah. Right, 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 right. Well, I'm going first. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love how, that's, that's called a Jedi mind trick. Right yes. There. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Jerry's got so many gems that I, I'll never forget. Like, even that was a teaching moment. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that was, that was like the start where I knew I, I was a junior at the time. I still had a year left of school. His wow. manager, Shapiro West, George Shapiro, 
and Howard West. Howard West has passed away. Um, George was so great. He was like, you know, we, we know you have a year left of school. We want you to finish school. And, uh, you know, we, we will, we'll get you into the clubs where I started out at the improv and the laugh factory MC, you know what I mean? Like wow. out of college, Wow. And, you know, so LA is like one of the tougher places to start doing stand up, mm -hmm. but it was also the best because the talent pool that I was around were all the best of the best. So right. you knew yeah. what the bar was and the bar was extremely high. Absolutely. And especially getting in the clubs that early. Yes. 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 It's yeah. it's funny. Like I remember people used to say, oh, he's funny, but he's green. And I used to get pissed off by that. I'd be like, well, what? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but it's it was honest. You know what I mean? Like right. I was I was 19, 19 years old, wow. you know, MCing at you know the, the the best clubs in LA with the best talent like it was it was a great way to learn good technique right right wow okay so before I mean this is amazing I because I've known you for a while and <laughs> this is amazing I feel like I feel like we're talking to like a, a child comedy prodigy right now yeah, right? <laughs> right? yeah. Um, so I gotta ask you with that being said what about some of those early shows were there was there that one show where you like that you, you bombed or just didn't go well and you kind of like, man, I don't like, You know what's funny, dude, is uh you gonna say no. Was, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, no. I, I'm not gonna like, I hate dudes like I never bombed. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. If you say that, you're not a comedian. Like, right, you know, right. You're yeah. like I remember I was gonna say when I first started out, the one good thing that I had going for me was I had my own style, you know what I mean? And mm. I knew that my style, you know, you got to win or lose with it. Right. And, you know, like I grew up in Northern California, you know, across the street from Apple computer. Uh, I used to work at Polo. So back then I dressed like Carlton, you know what I mean? Like, Oh yeah. Polo shirt. So yes. Like right. I would, you know, V-neck sweater, you know, like <laughs> I dressed like a black dude at a country club. <laughs> and, so, and my stand up wasn't really dirty, but it was like, I, I looked like the dude that I was presenting myself as. Right. 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 So sometimes that was cool. Sometimes it wasn't. You know? okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and at that time, when I first started, you know, like I would do these rooms, like I do those ghetto rooms, and they would be like, nah, dude. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you mean, bro. <laughs> I remember early on, I did this room at Carlos and Charlie's, right? Which was this kind of like, hood room and joe tory was hosting and joe tory's ruthless you know what i mean like yeah goes for it and so the the audience is in his rhythm and i remember like it was like there was a lot of like celebrities in the audience like you know jasmine guy and uh remember the movie she's got to have it the the lead nola nola darling was in the audience like and dude here i am i go on stage after joe is just blowing the paint chips off the room right right right. super dirty but hilarious right right and i go on with my little clean college act dude <laughs> and they were not having it they were oh. not having it dude and i remember bombing so bad like you know how like when you're young and you bomb and you're not really used to it so it's like severe turbulence right yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's Funny like word. it's jarring Right, yeah, right. it's jarring. It's, it's jarring. It, the perfect word for it. It's jarring. I was so knocked off my game, dude, that I remember looking up at the ceiling and like trying to count the tiles on the ceiling. Like that's how far <laughs> my brain got. <laughs> wow. Oh man, that's wow. Yeah. So, dude, like I kind of meekly got off stage. And I was like, yo, that sucked. I just bombed in front of Nola Darling, right? Oh, no, Nola. Oh, man. She's got to have it. it was so good. She, and she was, was so oh. Like, they had sat her right up front, and she was perfectly lit. And, you know, oh. like, I was like, oh, like, it was the worst 
early bombing experience. And the thing that made it the ultimate worst was when you bomb, you want the entire audience to hate you. You're like, all right, cool. This didn't work out. Everybody, please hate me. Right. It's never like that. There's always one dude, like this one dude was like, man, I saw what you were doing up there. They just weren't there for you. Right, like, right. Nah, dude, you need to hate me like everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the worst is if they feel sorry for you. Oh, yeah. Like, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Like, all love me or all hate me. But I don't no, want them. Dude, like, you don't want that. You don't want that one person that's like, man, I like you. I like what you nah, nah, do. Everybody, please take me. <laughs> Make this consensus. You want to be the unanimous MVP of bombing. <laughs> right. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, <clears throat> all right. So, all right. Now we go back. And so you, you graduate from college. At I this graduate point. from college. Um, I'm in the clubs. I'm emceeing. Um, I'm getting my feet wet. I feel like you know, I'm growing a lot during that time. And, you know, I'm coming across like at that time in the clubs in LA, you know, Seinfeld would still show up on a regular basis and do spots. And, you know, Tom and Roseanne were on the lineup a lot. Like oh, yeah. I have some of those uh, lineups from that period of time. And I'm like, wow, there was some super heavy hitters in the clubs. You know, George Wallace was in the clubs all the time. Oh, yeah. Like you were just seeing these giant, giant acts that were monsters. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that at that time, in comparison to where comedy is right now, the comics were more original. You know what I mean? Like they, right. Right. I felt like that era of comedy had just, like you really had to be kind of unique to make a name for yourself. You had to be funny, but you had to be unique. And I think now it's more homogenous, you know what I mean? Because comedy feels like it just caters to specific niches more now. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. like, like, like during <clears throat> that time, you definitely had to, you, you had to be your own thing. Right, right. So yeah, coming up during, like during that time, like I said, I worked with a lot of great comics. Um, I was able to, you know, I was acting also at the time. That's when I started to segue into acting. And, you know, yeah, like that, that stuff happened pretty organically, too. Like, and through through comedy. Okay. Did you take so any acting classes or no? I did. Uh, while yeah. I was in college, I took, um, I studied at the Limbeck School, Harvey Limbeck uh, Improv Comedy Workshop. Uh, and that was like, I wanted to do something, you know, I wasn't a theater major at UCLA. I was a political science major. And the reason mm -hmm. I was a political science major was I wanted a real major. Like the theater majors were cool, but they were way out there. Like they right. were like, we're so theater. We don't want to do TV and film. And I'm like, well, why not? Like, you know, <laughs> right. So yeah. I studied at the Limbeck school. <clears throat> um, so when I started to get my shots, acting wise like one of my first acting jobs was on married with children oh i saw goodness. that clip i was dude, like this clip. dude's old school bro yeah. married with children. Yeah, dude, that, that was, was my first jobs and it came out of surprisingly like i've been really lucky i i i can say that you know like i i, I like i'm on the, i'm on this path for a reason i've been really lucky that came out of i was opening for I think I was opening for Lopez at the time and we were doing the Irvine club and the casting directors for Mary with children happened to be in the audience. Wow. And this guy, dude, this guy. I'm telling you, dude, I'm telling you like the, the breaks that I've had, you know, like, it's <laughs> dude, like literally these, these, this is what every comedian, actor, entertainer has like, dreamed about like doing your thing and having a person sit in the audience and, and recognize afterwards and be like hey we think you can audition for stuff yeah. but that's like how it that's how it worked like so oh man his that's biggest crazy. break in week one is what most people won't experience ever ever <laughs> i was gonna say his i was gonna say his hero his, Shapiro, dude hold up his his first credit was opening for Seinfeld. yeah yeah Right? Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. It's That's amazing. amazing, crazy, dude. dude. It's crazy. And the funny thing was, this is how green I was. I called a friend of mine, my friend Jordan Brady, who's now a director. 
he was like the one established comic that I had his number, right? Right. And and after that Seinfeld thing, you know, I called him the next day. I said, "Yeah, this dude George Shapiro gave me his card. Is he legit?" <laughs> 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 the dude was Andy Kaufman's manager. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's and then amazing. my and then my buddy Jordan was like, "Yeah, he's one of the biggest managers in the business." I was like, oh, "Okay, well, I think I'm gonna call him." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love the fact that you said, "I think." Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> like almost there's still hilarious. contemplation. Uh, all right, I think I'll call him then. Yeah, that is hilarious, <laughs> dude. That's so all. Okay. the married with children thing came out of doing stand up, and that was great. Um, and then you know, like other other jobs happened. So when I was, you know, around that time in my early twenties, I was acting. I was doing stand up. Like it was like, you know, like it was it was it just all seemed to come. Wow, nice. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. First off, I just got to say, I used to love Married with Children. That was one of my favorite TV shows at that yeah. time. Right, loved it. Um, and then when I saw that clip, I was like, oh snap! I kind of lightweight remembered it. When yeah. I saw it, I was yeah. like, yo, this is crazy. Like, that's the dude. And and you killed it. You, yeah. Yeah, that was funny. Dude, it was funny as hell. You nailed it. Your timing was perfect. Your delivery of your lines. Because now, since I know you, now watching it, I'm like, all right. You know, if you yeah, sure. get to that analytical brain, right? Sure, when you watch sure. It, I was like, oh, he nailed this shit, dude. Yes, <laughs> yes. This spot on Married with but Children. But that's the thing, though. It's like. I did, I studied, you know what I mean? Like, right. I think a lot of people just think, oh, I'm funny and I'll just, you know, whatever happens. Mm -hmm. I think you definitely have to have technique with your craft, you know what right. I mean? Like, right. and it seems like the people that do have technique, they're the ones that blow up, but it looks like they're not, you know, like right. the game is like <clears throat> it to, to, to work, but make it look like you're not working. Right, 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 right. So now at this point, when you get this opportunity, are you signed with anyone? I was with, I was signed with Shapiro West. Oh, you were signed with him. Okay. Yeah. Were you touring or are you headlining? Uh, no, I was Not just headlining. getting in wherever I could. Like a lot of times I would be opening or featuring like, you know, um, I, w when I did Don't Be a Menace, after, after doing that, there was a time where I was like, well, maybe I'm not going to do stand up anymore and just focus on acting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. right. And I, I did, did another crazy. I have a lot of crazy stories. Uh, <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. I love it. I love it. So around that time, for some reason, Chris Rock befriended me. I still don't know to this day. Right. So don't be a menace's premiere was in New York. And he was like, hey, do you want to go to dinner? I was like, yeah, cool, right? Chris right. Rock. <laughs> of course. Yeah, it's a no-brainer, right? And so... I'm still waiting on that call. It's, it's funny that, you know, when you're young, you stay stuff without even thinking about it. And so mm -hmm. I was, like, talking to him, and I was like, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to keep doing stand-up, you know, because now that this movie's come out, you know, my acting is going to take off, and I'm not going to have to do that anymore, right? Right. And Chris Rock just quietly listens, right? Yeah. He goes, you should never want to quit doing stand-up because that is a night by night connection with your fan base and your uh, audience right. and they're going to support you regardless of anything mm -hmm. so why would you want to give that up right and i was like yeah you're right Man, that sound, <laughs> yeah i mean that's that sound <laughs> advice he's right he's right it's so it makes so much sense but you're in your own head thinking about what's going to come from these things that you're doing. Right. And it's like, just keep doing what you're doing. What you're doing is the way to do it. Right. And it's working. Right. And, and it's, it's working. working. And it's so working. So if I would have stopped doing stand up, like, I mean, it just would have been the dumbest thing ever. Right. 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 Like, that was, wow. that was like one of those gyms where it was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, you know, yeah. you basically stopped me from jumping over a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so okay so so now you're signed with shapiro you're yes. opening and featuring on the road um, yeah you have this this encounter with rock so he's like yo keep you got and you got the movie uh yeah. just to be clear uh yeah. don't be a menace in south central while drinking your your juice, juice in the hood, in the hood yeah. right in the hood. which you which, have to you say know, the whole title you got to say the whole <laughs> title right and and i mean the character on there is iconic 
just in the sense that every crazy legs almost he pretty much almost stole the show every scene that he was in he, he kind of stole the show right so at it, least for me it's, it's interesting um you know like i was friends with the wayans you know uh Sean and I were really close because we started in the clubs around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I ended up becoming friends with with Keenan and Damon and, you know, was really kind of mentored in a lot of ways by those guys. Um, you know, I, you know, they, they, I love them to death because they don't give you anything. You know what I mean? Like right. I helped write Don't Be a Menace as an uncredited writer. Wow. Uh, okay but still had to audition five times for crazy legs. So wow, wow, really do anything, you know, but yeah. they also let you know, if you're willing to do the work, this is the work that you have to do to get it. You know what right. I mean? So right. I feel like that friendship was invaluable because, you know, as you're navigating this business, it doesn't come with instructions, you know? What right. I mean? no. right, 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 right. It's always good to have people that can help you that are further along you know and you can learn by doing mm -hmm. right yeah okay. and by example and watching them too right exactly right. so that that was one of those things where when we did that movie we did that movie in 96 you know okay. and, and so it's been a minute but it's like a classic now like my my son is 17 mm -hmm. and he said to me one day he was like dad my friends think you're cool <laughs> <laughs> awesome you know what i mean like yeah. because they watch don't be a menace you know what i mean right so right for a movie that we did back then to still have like yeah oh yeah it's 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 out there like people dress up as characters from don't be a menace for halloween right Dude. i mean it was <clears throat> it was such a um I mean, the parody, right? And there's a combination of a number of different things, yes. but the timing of it, because I think the impact of Don't Be a Menace to Society, like during that time when those movies came out, right? South Central, Don't Be a Menace right. to Society, like right. they had such a, a cultural impact, right? Like yes. a huge impact, almost um, in a sense, like like uh, like gangster hip hop, right? Or gangster rap, like it showed a segment of society that people hadn't really seen up yes. close and personal, right? Yes. So it was, it was influential in that way, but then all yes. of a sudden, you get the parody of those movies because those movies are really intense in a lot of ways. Yes. So yes. now you get the parody, which kind of lightens it up a little bit. And we get to, you get to exaggerate the character. You, yeah. you get to laugh at it. And you know, what's interesting is they don't make comedies like that anymore. You know right. what I mean? It's like we've right. so uh, like, you know, uh, features now are big budget mm -hmm. things. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're Marvel superhero movies. Uh, right or these big action pieces, like there's not a lot of these funny, smaller comedies anymore. Like, they, right. you know, like that genre has gone away. Right. Maybe we should bring it back. I right? think, <laughs> Seriously. It's not just up to us though. I think studios need to know there's valuable, that, that there's value in that. Like, yeah, absolutely. I always felt like explosions are very expensive. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. 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 But real laughs, are the equivalent of explosions. Ah, that's yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. You know that. what I mean? Yeah, no, yeah. Absolutely. they're equally as impactful, why, right? Why, like movies like Don't Be a Menace and Fridays and, you know, have oh, yeah. the test of time because they're packed full of like funny explosions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, man, that's a great way to put that too. Great way to frame it. So yeah, because that movie is a classic, dude. I think, like you just said, Friday, like those movies, they're all kind of synonymous with uh, synonymous with each other as far as in, and right. for me in my brain, like lining them up in that time period. Um, okay, I so- I this too, it's, it's interesting because when Don't Be a Menace came out, you know, Fridays had come out six months before and they pushed up our release date because Fridays did so well. But right. up the release date, they didn't promote it in the normal same time frame as they mm. do with most features. Okay. So our film came out, there was a- big snowstorm on the east coast which kind uh, of like messed up our opening, opening night box office, box yeah. box office right so we did okay <laughs> but we didn't do as good as we hoped okay. and so i felt like all right well that was cool but it didn't quite do what we needed it to do mm -hmm. it wasn't until it went to cable that's where it really blew up yeah okay yeah and as 
CDs and DVDs got popular, that's when it, like, it, so it was like a delayed reaction. Right, right, you know I mean? right. Like, it's yeah, like yeah. The time, by the time it got popular, like, it, it, it's all in waves, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Pop was like, yeah, it's okay. But then, you know, when it went to cable and DVDs, then people started, like, it was one of those movies that aged well. Yeah, well, I, I, I could easily say that during that time, um, so I graduated from college in 96, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, it, it took a while before I got HBO and all this other stuff. But I remember that when it was on, when I was able to see it in that way, after yes. having seen it in theaters, yes. I legitimately watched that movie every time it was on. Like if I flicked through the <laughs> channels and I saw, I caught a scene, I just stopped and I'm there. Right. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so. Did your whole career change after the movie, you know, six months or whatever came out? You know what? It was weird. It was like, I remember, you know, like, cause I was always a stand up first and that was a character. Like it's so different than who I am. You know what I mean? Right. Like yeah. I right. tapped into parts of myself to make the character real, but you know, he talks in a high voice. He's, <laughs> yeah, I got a dream, you know, like <laughs> me, but that's a part of whatever that, that dude is. I found the, the realness of him. Right. Like, right. When it was like after, you know, when the heat of it was around, like I remember people being like, oh, you should go on stage in a wheelchair. And you know, oh. <laughs> they were trying to put you in that box permanently. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew better. I knew better. I was like, right. if I did that, it would be over. You know yeah, what I mean? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. My stand up is so different than the character Crazy Legs. You know what mm, I mean? Yeah. Right. So I kind of liked the fact that people knew the character but didn't know my stand up. In fact, before the pandemic, I spent a year and a half touring with Sean Wayans. And it was great because, you know, I would go do these dates with him. It was just the two of us. And I wouldn't really advertise. I would just show up, right? Right. And would do my stand up. And, uh, you know, of course, people would know, oh, you're Crazy Legs. Right. But it's weird for Crazy Legs fans to then experience my stand up because they, like, I think it gave them a fuller picture of, like, oh, wow, like I had no idea yeah. this had chops like this in the stand up game. Right, right, right. 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 Um, wow. Okay. You know what I was going to ask you was, I, I, it just popped in my head when you said it, the stand up game. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say, but you also, you're on the Jamie Foxx show, right? Yeah. So, and, that, and that came out of, you know, like, like I said, starting in L.A., watching everybody come up like, you know, I mean, I was around when Jamie first started doing the clubs as a stand up okay. and we became friends like, you know, comics bond off of jokes and stuff. You know right. what I mean? Like right. I had this joke in my act that I remember Jamie used to really like where you know, remember when the Arsenio Hall show was on the first, the first one, not the second one, the first one. Yeah. <laughs> and I used to do this joke about Arsenio being hyped, more hyped on mediocre guest night, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got way more energy. He's like, ah, yes, give it up for Ray J. Johnson, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that's funny. This long list of these mediocre guests, like Morgan Fairchild's Barbara is on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like this list of like these, all these obscure, like, you know, yeah. one of the kissing bandits friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And so he, he thought that joke was hilarious. So like we kind of bonded over that. And then when he saw Don't Be a Menace, he offered me a part on uh, on the Jamie Foxx show. And so I guest starred on one episode of season three, and then they offered me a part along with Chris Spencer and Alex Thomas to be his friends at Jingles 2000. See, so- okay, now I'm glad you mentioned that because if I go back, when I first met you, right? I met you in San Francisco and we did a show at the Rickshaw. You, know, yes. you yes. me and Barry Sobel, and then, some years later, we end up, I end up opening for you and Alex, Alex English in Sacramento, in uh, Sacramento right? Yes. So now going back and knowing that you and Chris Spencer knew each other in college. Yes. And knowing that he was a stand up, and I didn't know that at the time, but knowing that now and knowing that Chris Spencer was on that show, like, dude, I mean, it seems like you were just surrounded by talent and friends. Yeah, well, that was the thing. Like, we all sort of piled around uh, in LA and we were like our own little 
click of friends. You know what I mean? Okay, like we right. were friends first and we did stand up and it was good. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. important to have a crew of people that are supportive, that push you and all like, you know, I mean, we were all individually talented, but I think as a group and as friends, like we pushed each other. Right, right. Wow. Okay, so you're on the Jamie Foxx show, right? So and the Jamie Foxx show, I ended up doing 25 of the 100 episodes. Um, and, you know, like that show, the last season, like I really was getting my footing. They were writing more for my character. Uh, but, you know, the show ended after 100 episodes. Okay. So, you know, it was like just as it was good. It's like, oh, I'm on a sitcom, you know, like, yeah. like oh, over <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, it was good like people like it it's still in reruns i think i knew that it was going to be on forever because uh you know jamie's talent like that was the weird thing about doing the jamie fox show was jamie was so super talented like as a musician as a performer as an actor it was like being around this this just giant well of talent and you knew like it was just beginning for him well you know okay I mean? uh, yes and i'm glad you said that because having watched the jamie fox show i remember the beginning the first half of it i think I've, i don't know how many seasons it was total but i remember it's the first five, half it was five seasons it's five seasons so the first couple or first maybe the first few seasons was in the in the hotel in the hotel right? yeah right and he's kind of bouncing off the other characters and yeah. I, I remember that when they transitioned over to him working at Jingles 2000, um, I felt like that was more of a showcase because Jamie was starting to blow up in other aspects of his yeah. life, right? Yeah. So the show was almost like a way of showcasing everything that he could do, right? Yeah. Like we yeah. knew that he could sing because I, yes. I think an album had come out at that point, right? Yeah. We yeah. knew he could act. And so watching the show was just like, like, okay, it was like his platform to say, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, and I can do this. And and it was, you know, it was just fun and to watch, like, basically. Also, I think it was smart to bring us all on because it gave him more people to play off of. You know what right. I mean? Like, right, right. right. And, and like, you know, like my character Mouse was like this dude that, you know, was like naive and, you know, would make a bunch of mistakes. And, you know, Jamie's like this super cool dude. So it was like kind of fun to be a character that's like almost the opposite of him, but right. looked up to Jamie and wanted to like be that, but could never quite pull it off. You know? Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Like, like our dynamic worked really well to uh, to play off each other. And you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. people really like, sometimes when I go on stage and I only bring up crazy legs, sometimes people get mad. They're like, why didn't you talk about mouse? You know? <laughs> right, 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 right. It's just good though. It just means that the the character's connected. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right, absolutely. right, right. Oh, so that's like, and that, you know, that show, once it was over, you know, that's when Jamie started hosting stuff. And that's when like my writing producing career took off. Well, okay. okay. That was the next thing. Okay. Yeah, that was like, but it was pretty seamless. It was like the Jamie Foxx show ended. Jamie started hosting like the MTV Awards, the SB Awards, and we would do something on the Jamie Foxx show where we would do a scripted pass and then we would do a wild pass. And the scripted pass was what was on the on the page. Okay. But the wild pass was anything goes. And oh okay as long as you as long as you end like start where you want and then end at the spot but you can do whatever point. in between yeah like yes. you know like you would, like, you would basically take the scripted words and just open it up like almost, okay you know a jazz like, set where you improv yeah yeah around it and then they would use both those passes to cut the episodes together dude that is that is so cool and so fun especially as a comedian or a talent well, it was great it was great yeah. and, you know like i studied as an improv actor so that was right in my wheelhouse. Yeah. So mm. some of the most fun on that show was being able to like, let it go. And so, you know, Garrett Morris was on that show who's original SNL cast member. And sometimes in those wild takes, he'd be like, man, I don't know what to do. And I would pitch him stuff. I go, you should do this. And he's like, oh, that's good. You're good. That's good. Right. right, right, right. And he'd be like, oh, that's funny. And that was really like, I kind of credit Garrett Morris for, really waking up the writer producer in me 
because I didn't realize it, but that's what I was doing. I was pitching ideas. And when Jamie started hosting stuff and he hired me to write and produce for him, like the foundation started on the Jamie Foxx show. Wow. 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 That's huge, man. That's huge. Because yeah. I'm, I'm glad you segued into that because that was going to be the next part, right? Like we've talked about the stand up. The, the comedian you, we talked about the actor in you. And now I was going to ask about the writer. Yeah, and, and that's producer. how it happened. It was pretty seamless. Like, it wasn't like I was done acting. It's just the writing, producing jobs didn't stop coming. You know what I mean? It was like, wow. once it opened up, it was like, well, do you want to do this? And do you want to do this? And, you know. So, so what's, uh, what's some stuff you've written and produced? Well, I, uh, I wrote on The Tonight Show for a year. Wow last year that um that jay leno was on before conan took over and that was a really interesting year to be the only black writer on that show <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember, like my first day being hired like i was uh prior to that uh i was working on last comic standing as a producer right and that was the year that jeff die and eliza schlesinger tied and so oh, okay. I got okay. hired to come on board to write content for them because they just let the show couldn't just keep being these head to head competitions. Right. Mm -hmm. So we wrote some stuff on that. They were looking for a black writer on the tonight show because Barack Obama had just secured the nomination and executive at NBC was like, Oh, there should probably be a black writer on this show. Uh, yeah, there there could be a black be. president, maybe a yeah. writer. Right. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's time. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, NBC had a diversity department. There were no black writers in the diversity department. Okay. Uh, which that for two thousand eight that says something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A writer who was on staff said, "I know a guy that I think would be perfect." I was finishing up Last Comic Standing. They had me write a submit some jokes, you know, because mm -hmm. they were looking for a monologue writer. Uh, I submitted a page of jokes, 25 jokes. They liked the jokes. I interviewed with them and got hired. So I spent the final year on the show as, you know, a monologue writer on that show. Wow. That's amazing. And how is that? Is that how is that job? It's a. Conan O'Brien says being a writer in late night television is like having a gun to your head and you're a hamster on a treadmill and you have to keep running and the gun stays at your head and that's what the job is. Wow. It is, uh, it is not an easy job. Right. It's one of the more difficult jobs. Like I equate it to getting paid to go to grad school. Wow. 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 So it wasn't fun necessarily. No, I wouldn't say it was fun. It wasn't okay. fun. like getting, I remember one day I got, I got four jokes in the monologue, which is really difficult. The mm. monologue at the time was 27 to 35 jokes a night. There's 18, there were 18 writers on the show and wow. Jay takes submissions from faxers. People can fax in jokes. So oh, wow. he reads about a thousand jokes a day to get to that 27 to 35. Wow. A day, so was, Sal. And that's wow. every day. And it's not just the easy days when the news stories are like, Machine Gun Kelly proposes to Megan Fox and they drink each other's blood. Like you can write jokes about that all day. Right. Right. Or Pete Davidson is sleeping with this person. Like those are the easy joke writing days. Some days it's just regular hard news. And it's right. hard to keep, like it's hard to write jokes about uh, what's going on, you know, over in Yemen. In Yemen, exactly. In Yemen. Yeah. exactly. Give me five jokes about Yemen. Like that's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, can I give you, so, I'm give you two and a half? <laughs> so some were way tougher than others. And it's a competitive job. Like as a, as a writer, you're hired on 13 week contracts. And so wow, okay. I didn't know that. you can, you know, they can not pick up your contract and, right. you know, like after 13 weeks. So, you know, what the score is every day you're going there to get your next pickup. Right. You know what I mean, right. So right. it was a lot of pressure. Like it was, 
it was great. Like I remember, you know, my first day that I was hired, I remember John McCain was the A guest, right? Okay. So he's the guest, and this is, like I said, during that run where Barack Obama is running against John McCain. And so right. like that to me, like I'm the first black writer because there's a chance the black guy might become president. And now this guy is the, is the lead guest. Yeah, who's trying to keep the first black guy from becoming, yeah. And I remember, I'm like, whoa, I'm on the other side now. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, oh, like, yeah. And because of Barack, but I now got to service John McCain. And yeah. oh, that man. first day, you know, like the first day of any job, you're trying to get situated. And I remember I was getting my office together and I still wanted to like make sure I got my submissions in of jokes. So I had a chance to get stuff in the monologue. I'm eager to prove myself. Uh, they had a, uh, uh, the, the way they did things was you emailed the jokes to Jay's secretary, then you printed them out and then you hand walked your jokes over to his office and you turned them in almost like it was a term paper. Wow. It was cool because it gave you a chance to have a few minutes with the host and say, oh, I focused on writing more jokes in this area because I think this story is interesting. So you could actually pitch why you wrote what you wrote. Right. I remember that first day, I'm eager to get jokes in and my office was way down the hall, right? Like, right. you know, I'm the, 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 the black writer and perspired <laughs> is the rule, right? right? My office is so far down the hall, it's hilarious. Right. So I'm running to get my jokes in. Like I literally had to go like downstairs, down this long hallway, upstairs to Jay's office, right? So like, it was a maze, right? right. And I'm looking over my jokes to make sure they make sense. And I'm just moving, right? And I end up walking smack dab into John McCain, right? Oh, <laughs> wow. Where I had contact in everything. And I was moving and I hit him in a way where I was like, oh, damn. Like, I just, I like, where's the, where are the, where's, where's the secret service? Like, right, right, right. Like, I almost killed the dude. <laughs> <laughs> writer is able to have get this close to John McCain and damn near take him out right, 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 right. <laughs> but I'll say this dude I had a whole lot of respect because he took that contact and he right. couldn't have been any cooler I was like oh my god <laughs> sir I am so sorry I apologize he was right. like oh it's fine like, yeah. like it made me have respect for him you know what I mean okay. <laughs> I didn't right. vote for him but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I still have respect for him. <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool, man. Oh, man. That's awesome, dude. So, um, okay. So, because I'm, I'm looking at time, and I don't know how much time you have left, but um, I know I want to talk to you about the documentary. Yes. Right? And yes. I also want to talk about, about Gary Shandling as well. Yes. Like, yes. meeting Gary and, and establishing it. that. We're yeah. on a roll. Like, we're yeah, on yeah. I'm like, yo, let's keep it going. You're killing it. You're killing it, You're killing it, dude. You're in the zone right now. Um, I'm like, I hate to interrupt it. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no, dude. It's like, it's it's interesting. Like, that, the, the writing and producing phase. So, you know, after writing on The Tonight Show, I wrote on Lopez Tonight. I actually wrote the pilot for that. Georgia reached out to me. Like, at that time, I was sort of making a name for myself as, you know, one of the stronger comedy writer producers I used to open for George we had a rapport so when he got that opportunity to do his late night show he reached out to me and you know we did this we did the pilot for Lopez tonight it got picked up mm -hmm. I was there for a year um that was a cool experience um and then uh after that after that ended uh the documentary came about uh, I had a mutual friend, the documentary Dying Laughing, which right. uh, I spent four years making. Uh, wow. And it really is like an in-depth look at stand-up, like the ups and downs in stand-up. The, you know, I wanted to do a very real perspective about what it takes to be a stand-up. Because oh, wow. a lot of people just see the big, big, big names and they see them at that place. But the way this business know is, you guys know this, that you know, that, that introductory part is the part that bonds us all. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so I collaborated with these British filmmakers. They did a movie that I saw a documentary uh, about hip hop that I really liked because it had this, like all the documentaries prior to that about hip hop 
you know, they still presented the rappers as kind of caricatures. Mm. And yeah. it was one of the first documentaries that went into the artistry of the craft. And oh, okay. I'd never seen that before. And so uh, when, when we were connected, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to go on this journey with these guys. And also, too, just so you get the ups and downs of this, I had just been dropped by my agents prior to mm. deciding to make this documentary. Okay. I had this agent and he was like, yeah, it's tough business. And, you know, we're going to let you go. And yeah. I've never been dropped and it was devastating, dude. It was right. devastating. And I felt like I was still extremely viable in the business. Right. You know what I mean? But right. the industry turns its back on you. You can do one of two things. You can quit or you can fight back. Right, and right. So I figured, okay, I'm going to go on this journey and make this documentary. And, you know, in, in a way, it kind of honors what stand-up has provided to me. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, it was a way to give back to this thing that has given me so much. Right, And right. so it wasn't easy because we did it outside of agents and managers and made this thing like initially our documentary was going to be about bombing you know about oh. um, comics worst nights on stage which right. we all have those stories they're all fascinating they take you to a place they reveal your vulnerability you oh, know absolutely you know what I mean? yeah uh, but when we started to sit people down in the chair we realized that the story of comedy was bigger than just bombing right you know i mean right, so right. floors more than just bombing like right. it's one aspect of the documentary but not the sum total it really is the ups and downs of the craft of stand-up right did you right. uh catch anybody counting tiles when they were bombing i think i'm the only one that counted <laughs> <laughs> i will say this you know we interviewed 130 plus people for the documentary oh wow and i think upwards of around 50 made the final cut so okay. we okay. act like an embarrassment of riches right uh, right uh and and everyone was really forthright and and open and honest and you know some of the bombing bombing stories or the truths that are revealed in our documentary are pretty telling like kevin hart tells a great story about when he was first starting out in New York and the owner of a comedy club in New York, just saying to Kevin, I don't think you got it. I don't think you have it. Thanks to wow. Me. Yeah. I and think I saw that one in the preview too. I was like, man, yeah. this is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. so everyone's really open about it. And, you know, there's a lot of big names and a lot of people that are just great standups that tell the tale. Right. Uh, right. And, and it was great to, you know, by that time, you know, I'd sort of, like I said, made a name for myself as a writer producer, aside from being a standup. So I think there was a trust level there where people were like, okay, I can, I can give my full self to this. And right. yeah. everybody did. Right. That's what so cool. you know. I'm really proud of, but it wasn't easy. Like I, I heard no a lot. Like, in fact, my mentor, Gary Shandling, when I first asked him to be a part of it, he said, no, you know what I mean? Oh, wow. like, okay. I got it. I, I understood it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he had sort of been done dirty by, by, creatives that he couldn't trust and so he wanted to make sure he was in a trust situation like right towards the end i showed him a clip and he was like this is great is it too late for me and i'm like gary it's never too late for you you're gary right. <laughs> yeah, you're gary shanley you're gary shanley uh that's all well before we move on to gary i just want to say this real quick um the uh the part about getting dropped by your agency right and mm -hmm. how devastating that was um there's a there's a saying that I always I, you know I'm always I speak in cliches sometimes right like yeah. whatever but yeah. but to me what this brings to mind is um, we're not what happens to us but we are how we respond to those things. True. Right. It's right. Hard, it's hard to it's hard to be bigger than the moment sometimes. Yes. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. Because you know, like I remember in that instance. Like, you know, I was always so forthright about the business and what my commitment was and, you know, trying to create things that end up being bigger than just you and, you know, are influential in ways that are bigger than just those short term needs. So 
I've always approached the business that way. And I've always right. approached the business that nothing is promised and, you know, and, you know, put out the kind of energy that you want to get back. And right. So for this agent to be so dismissive and, you know, really didn't see my value. Like it was, it was a, like I said, it was a very crushing blow right. and had this opportunity, had, had I not decided to embark on this journey and go, okay, I'm going to use that energy of being dismissed to create something that I believe in. Right. You know, it did take, I, I had to go through the period of <sighs> feeling the pain of being, right. The grief. You know I mean? Yeah, it's like it's a loss, right? It's like yes, grieving it's, a loss. It's very much a loss. Yeah. So and, yeah. And, yeah. You and for you can't make somebody believe in you. Right. You know I mean? like, right. Right. That, right. That's a tough lesson too, because they're just they're just sometimes when people don't get it, and right. they're never gonna get it. And right. right. You turn the corner and you blow up. You know they're gonna kick themselves, but they were never in your corner to begin with. Right. 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 Well, I'm glad you persevered and pushed through because, you know, we, 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 we all know people who've had those, uh, those pivotal or transitional moments where something right. happens right. and sometimes it'll cripple them for life. Right. Yes. And they yes. never fully recover. And yes. then there's others that, you know, those of us, I think who, um, you know, we take that moment to grieve the loss and we lick our wounds and we cry, we get upset, punch walls, whatever the case may be. That's, that's what I've done. Uh, <laughs> I can't speak for everybody, but, uh, but, but I then, you like, know, I, I honestly feel like the business is a series of ups and downs. You know right. what I mean? Like right. there's times where there's more going on and you're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm pretty good right now. And then there's other times where you're just like, nothing's going on. Like, right, <laughs> like, right, right, like right. you know, I gotta, yeah. I gotta create some, some action. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Right, right. And yeah. keep pushing, keep pushing yeah, and keep like, moving. I gotta light the fire to this wet wood, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think ultimately too, what you're saying is, is that um, we have to find that place where we continue to believe in ourselves when yeah. others, when others don't sometimes. The, I think that's the thing that stand-ups have that you have to have to do stand-up in the first place is you have to believe in yourself. Right. Even when people don't believe in you. And I think that's one of the things about our documentary that people connect to. It's like, you better think you're funny. You better believe in yourself as a viable, that, that you can make a viable contribution to mm. the game. Because if you leave it to other people, you're lost. Right, you know right, 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 right. Right. Can people, can we, uh, where can people see the documentary now? Uh, Dying Laughing is on iTunes and it's on Amazon. So cool. yeah, you can find it. It's out there. Okay. Yeah. All it's right, on. Cool, there. man. Yeah. I, I actually like, I almost wish we would have sold it to Netflix because it definitely would have got more eyes. And I feel like it's one of those things that, you know, I, and I didn't discover this until going out on the road. When I went, went out with Sean, we did a club up in mm. Seattle and, you know, like they asked me, well, what do you want for credits? And I'm like, well, you can say I was crazy legs and don't be a menace. And, you know, I made this documentary called Dying Laughing. And they were like, wait, what? Like, I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. documentary Dying Laughing. They're like, we watch that all the time. You know wow. what I mean? Oh, wow. So, like, that was like the first time where I was like, yo, this did make an impact. You know what right, I mean? Cool, cool, right, cool. right writing and producing and creating something once you create it and let it go out in the world you know you don't get that immediate feedback with with something like that you know what i mean like right. it makes an impact but like it took going to go perform at a comedy club to see oh these people that work at this club have embraced this and, right. and yeah their own you know what i mean mm -hmm. wow okay um so so you're you um the documentary is done and the Gary done. and Gary wants to he wants to hop in later and so Gary hops in later and he's great like that last the last few interviews we did were like a list a list a list it was like okay. you know Gary Shanley Jamie Fox uh Bob Saget you know rest oh wow. Bob was great. Uh, yeah. And I'm also in Gary Shandling's documentary that Judd Apatow made, uh, The Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling, which okay. I recommend everyone who has ever thought about doing anything creative watch. 
Judd okay. made a great documentary. And it really, if you want to understand who Gary Shandling was, aside from being a phenomenal cre creative and a great comedian, what his philosophy about life was, I recommend everyone watch that documentary. Okay. Wow. And and where, where can we find that one at too as well? That uh, that actually won the Emmy two years ago for oh. best documentary. And that's available, you know, like you can buy it everywhere. And okay, it's, okay. Yeah, it's one of those, it it premiered on HBO, uh, but it's it's out there and available. So okay. yeah, if you get, okay. I highly recommend it. I okay. Recommend it. Well, um, I read your piece in the Hollywood Reporter yeah. Right. And about, you know, you and Gary's friendship. So sorry for your loss in regards oh, to Gary. Thanks, man. Thank yeah. You. Appreciate that. Yeah. Gary was like a brother to me. He was, you know, I met him uh, when I guest starred on Larry Sanders, uh, which was great because it was one of my favorite shows. Right. And stand up, you know, when I when I talk about that time when I was younger and I paid attention to stand like that dude used to just make me laugh. His jokes were hilarious. Like he just had that you know, the stuff he was talking about was like, this is a real dude. And he's talking yeah. about real, like, you know, he used to do that joke about seeing, you know, ugly people kissing in the mall. And <laughs> at the time I worked in the mall and I was like, I, I seen that. I seen that. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was weird because when I got cast to, to, to be on Larry Sanders, I was playing a writer. And oh, okay. I was just a, an actor and a stand-up at the time. It was before my writing career. So in some ways, you know, Gary was kind of this, this prophecy of, you know, a part of myself that I didn't even know was going to become my reality. Right. Wow. wow. So wow. That, that was cool. Like, we ended up having a conversation. Like, a lot of times when you guest star on shows, you, uh, you know, you're a hired gun. You come in, you do your job, you hopefully don't make mistakes and you make enough of an impact where they're like, maybe we'll have them back. You know what I mean? Right. But that's the mindset. You know, rarely do you have like real interaction with the principal players, you know? Right. Aside right. From, oh, hey, yeah. how are you? Good morning, that kind of thing. But Gary and I, you know, uh, ended up having a conversation we we ended up talking about Muhammad Ali and we connected over Muhammad Ali and and the conversation that we had initially was so like nuanced and real and you know he really wanted to know what my perspective was of being in the business and what my journey like you know like he he was very interested in a way that most people on that level aren't right, right. you know right. what i mean and so right. we connected he had this invite only basketball game that I got invited to play in, you know, I'm a big hoop head yeah. and apparently I played well enough and nobody got injured. That I got injured. <laughs> <laughs> no twisted ankles, no poor hamstrings. Exactly. Right? <laughs> so, you know, like our friendship grew from that, uh, the people that also played in that game, you know, Sarah Silverman, uh you know just so so many great comics played. i saw you said uh sandler he likes to body people up a lot oh yeah that? yeah no sandler <laughs> sandler plays like charles oakley all right he's yeah he's charles oakley that dude will bow you up he yeah, i was gonna the say bow. charles oakley coming with the bows yes, yes that's yeah that's that's uh adam spirit animal <laughs> <laughs> but adam will bow you up so, uh, yeah, Adam played in that game. You know, Sasha Baron Cohen played in that game. Oh, he's tall as hell. How do you, how do you get <laughs> tall and lanky and yeah. surprisingly athletic? Kevin Nealon played in that game. Um, you know, Sarah Silverman, of course. Uh, it was a great group of people, and we're all connected because of Gary. You know what I mean? Wow. Like yeah. that's wow. the equivalent of Gary's family. And, you know, over the course of 18 years, uh, like I said, our friendship grew and got better and closer, you know, before he passed the last two projects that he was in, you know, he asked me to help him get ready for comedians and cars and become oh, wow. my connection to Jerry. Like that was very personal and meaningful. And, you know, I was thankful that he asked me to help him get ready for that. Oh, that's really cool going to be one of the last things that he did right. but between that and the documentary dying laughing those are the last two appearances that he made before he passed oh wow wow wow, wow. wow. that's huge um wow man so uh Sula, you've had a 
an amazing career that continues. And Crazy. how long is yeah? How long has it been now? You've been in the industry for. I I, I graduated college in ninety, and so okay. I started doing wow. up in eighty nine. Wow. So uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a minute, and I feel like I'm still like, you know, you you still feel like you're trying to blow it wide open. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. What are you working on now? Well, uh, the last two projects I did, um, I wrote on the Emmys for Cedric oh. the Entertainer. Uh, okay, cool. Cedric and I have wrote together. I produced one of his earlier specials uh, for HBO. And, you know, I wrote on him, uh, wrote for him on the Correspondence Dinner. Uh, I wrote for him on the AMAs when he hosted. So we, you know, we have a working relationship um that's really cool like you know I, I like Cedric a lot and we you know vibe really well and I feel right. like we've been able to create really cool stuff um when he asked me to write on the Emmys like you know that's rarefied air dude like oh yeah, 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 yeah. It, you know that was a that was a really great experience and you know like it was funny like the after the Emmys Cedric's like, yo, we just did the Emmys, dog. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty awesome, man. <laughs> Which was cool. And um, you know, and then a lot of the same writers, we recently did the American Music Awards with uh with Cardi B, and that was fun and cool. And you know, uh hopefully I'll be doing the Oscars this year. Oh uh, wow. wow, that'd be awesome. Yeah, we'll yeah, see. I, it hopefully. depends on the post, you know, like you know, dude, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, hey, be before awesome. uh, before we let you go, I gotta ask. I see you got a pair of Jordan ones back there. You got a you got a big sneakerhead. I am a giant sneakerhead. Let me really? tell you, yeah. I am a sneakerhead where my apartment looks like I used to work at Foot Locker. <laughs> uh, I got hey. mad one day and decided to quit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was gonna say you stole all the shoes. <laughs> yeah, I like taking all this. These actually are a pair of eighty five Jordan ones. What, Uncle? that uh that lives in san fran next to the punchline uh these were his he gave them we have we both have the same birthday my birthday was january 12th so just recently passed okay, uh, happy, happy birthday. birthday thank you i appreciate it uh and so one year he gave me these as a birthday present wow <laughs> nice yeah it's a dope it's first of all like i'm a huge sneakerhead so that's already cool it's a pair of 85 jordan ones wow favorite uncle that i share a birthday with so wow yeah so yeah, this, yeah. About his i'm a that's I'm, a weird, I'm wearing these tonight the, oh the, nice, the three. nice. <laughs> the threes. i like those those just came out that's a yeah. that's a that's a good cop i gotta tell you yeah. that good these guy. are well these i got these these are the katrina ones that they yeah, released those in are 2018. Great, dude. like yeah i think you know like it's funny like so many sneakers come out now that you know you really can like skip a bunch of them that's yeah. a pair you're going to be glad that you got and they're going to age well. You can, you know, don't, you'll never wear those and be like, ah, these old things. You know what I mean? Right. They're comfy. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is the basketball from Gary's game. Oh, oh shit. whoa. Yeah. yeah. I kept the, I kept the net and that's the basketball. And wow, this basketball, man. It's funny. Like uh, the pump, uh, the, the pump broke in it, which kind of feels very Gary. Uh, <laughs> and put it in a case so that's wow. awesome that's really awesome man yeah so all right Suli. before we let you go man i just want to ask you this okay um, you've been doing this for a long time and you've had a lot of ups and downs and you've had some pretty amazing experiences and thank you for sharing all that with us um i would ask if you had to relay any message to anybody who was listening to this podcast and in any genre of work or field uh, -huh. uh what would your advice be to them as far as like trying to, to keep it moving? Um, I would say that first and foremost, you have to have a commitment and a belief in your abilities. Mm -hmm. And you have to almost be tone deaf to any negative energy and remove yeah. negative energy. Right. And sometimes when you're on your path, right? Like Gary said this, he said, um, there are two kinds of people, right? people that'll come into your life to help you stay on path and people that'll try and pull you off path. Mm. And you have to figure out who's who, because yeah. not everybody in your life is there to keep you on path. Right. And I've been in situations in my life where I've trusted people and befriended people that may not have necessarily been trying to keep me on path. 
Right. So that's the advice I would give anybody pursuing anything that they love and believe in is yeah. make sure that you keep that close to your heart and let that motivate your actions. Yeah. And yeah. don't surrender it because the second you surrender it, the dream dies. Right. Truth. Truth. Wow. Nice. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything else. Yeah. That. No. That's hey, it. man. That's it. That is it. <laughs> My uh, job. Yes. Straight up, bro. That's bro. it. Just walk that drop. That's it. So, Suli, hey, man, it's been an honor and a pleasure That's to have amazing, you amazing, man. Amazing yeah. stories. We appreciate every minute you gave us. Yes, sir. Oh, Thank cool. you so much for your this time, fun, man. dude. Like, this is, this is what, you know, podcasts should be. Like, you know. Hey, man. Yeah. We're yeah. talking about it. It's like, so many times it's like, well, we just come on. We just make up stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, what, who cares? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that's when you go like this. You go, uh, I'll be right back. I got to use the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And you just never come back. And you cut the computer off on the side. Like, <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna have to use that quote to advertise in the future. Uh, this is what podcasts are supposed to be. Suli McCall. Suli McCall. Yes, I'll take it. I like that. That's it. Like That's that. it. So, all right. Well, thank you, sir. You have a great day. And uh, uh, this was fun, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah actually, any, anytime. Thank anytime. You. And we, who knows, we may come back and after we get to a certain number, we have an anniversary and go back and. Visit I mean, the, I'd like to come back two. and check out the the shoe collection sometime. Uh, so. I, I yeah. Got two ones, dude. Trust me. I got like right. if, if this one is just this one, Ooh. I got some. Ooh. I got some heat. All nice. right. All right. All right. We'll 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 dig into that next time. I'm like, I don't even. I I I, I barely talk about it. That's the kind of yeah. Like, yeah. oh let me let me just say this i'll leave this okay. as a tease for a future episode okay i've been to the nike headquarters i had a friend that used to be the creative director of brand jordan wow uh, dude you know what that means sal I'll he got leave. anything he wants <laughs> dude he got he got the stuff peace <laughs> all right <laughs> Oh, geez, that's awesome! He just bailed. That was that was smooth. that was great. That was the mic drop, dude. He that dropped two mics mic on that. Drop. He just pod dropped. Wow. Yeah, he pod. He just pod dropped. He dropped so. the pod. Hey, dude. Wow. Well, there um, you go, Reg. Good one, buddy. There you go. Hey, he delivered. There it he is. Came through. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Uh, wow, man, that was really amazing. I mean, to hear the story. That's crazy, dude. It's like Shapiro, Jerry Seinfeld, Seinfeld Chris Rock. Rock. Gary Jamie Sandling, Fox, Jamie Fox. Fox. I mean, and and to hear how things transpired and happened for him, right? Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. you know, I remember years ago, you and I were talking about this, and I won't go on too long, but remember we were talking about um, the opportunity that, that Marcella Arguello got at the comedy store with Chris Hardwick sitting in the back, right? Yeah. She just kind of shows up one night after her show is canceled. He sees her, boom he invites her to do his show and then he he basically gets her management and then he kind of helped propel her career in a certain way and i don't know if you remember us having this conversation i was like i was like sal that is that is so rare right like every comic right. wants that opportunity where the guy's sitting in the back like you, you everyone's looking for just that to happen once right yeah. suli mccullough has had that happen multiple times multiple <laughs> times and and even I mean, to the point that he even said, I will say that I'm lucky, right? In that way. But it's I think a lot of it is serendipity too, being in the right place at the right time. Doing I mean, right and thing. also like to get that much heat right in the beginning. It's a good thing he didn't fall off. He could have fallen off into the drugs or anything. Oh, anything, anything. Like, cause right. that that young and that much money, and I don't even know about it, money, but he had that much power. He had to do any shows, Shapiro. Well, that much access, bro. Yeah. That's what it is. Move, right? That movie, he was young when he did that. He yeah, style, exactly, you know? exactly. And then the multiple television spots uh, and you're in you that know. comedy world where that's a bunch of dark older it could have been messed up world that you know and he's 19 geez. he's 19 dude we're talking about the 80s the 80s was the resurgence yeah, of comedy late 80s, in yeah, a certain way yeah right yeah, so, so there was a lot of booze and drugs and sex and you know just suicide as well like there was a lot yeah. of pitfalls um with comedy during that time as it was starting to gain its traction again right yeah and so yeah. um so yeah, man, props to Suli for coming through, man. He came through big time. Yeah, uh, that was cool. Was and he called his buddies like, should I, should I even hit up this Shapiro guy? Dude, that's one of the biggest guys. <laughs> what are you doing? And I love that he said, mm, I think I should call him then. <laughs> I think I'll call him. You think? That's so funny. <laughs> so, um, all right, all right man. man. Good times. Yeah, good times, man. Uh, 
All right, so I guess it's time to sign us out. We get out sign of here. Sign us out, man. I got a whiz. Okay. Hey, uh, so to all our guests, to all our listeners out there, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, we had a great time uh, spending, uh, talking with Suli McCullough. We thank him for taking the time to, to be so open and sharing with us his experiences and his life. Um, we do this every week. We love it. We hope that you enjoy it. Please, if you do, uh, subscribe and share it with your friends. And we should put a Venmo up or something. Maybe people want to donate to us. Yeah, that'd be great. We can start. Right, Maybe I'll, we should I'll look into that. Yeah, put the put. The, we'll get the Venmo. Because we gotta then. pay for this. We gotta pay for the Zoom. I gotta bug it's, Reggie every month to pay his Sal. share. This is not easy for people. We could talk about the finances off the air. Just I just Josh. <laughs> no, I know. No, you, you but know I always good. pay. I always pay. Always paid do. Up. Reggie's all paid up. He's all yeah, paid I'm all up. paid up. And no but one we can needs do is, to go after him. We're good. Exactly. But we'll uh, and we'll come up with some spitballing mm. merch. Some ideas. Oh, that'd be a good idea. Maybe we yeah. should do that. Yeah, we'll come okay. up with our spitballing merch. Um, Sal and Reggie spitballing. This is right? how podcasts so. are supposed to be. So exactly. I like that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So make, make that. That's a quote. We'll put that. That's a. Yeah. We'll add that to it. So okay. Once again, our my uh, my attempt at a short outro. Turn Never happens. I gotta interrupt every outro. <laughs> every outro. Extend the <laughs> outro. So, so hope you guys enjoyed it. Please subscribe and share with your friends, and uh, look out for that Venmo coming up soon. <laughs> but uh, we've had a great time. We hope you love it. That's Sal Kalani. I'm Reggie Steele, and this is Spitballing. Peace. Peace.